So in today's lecture, I'm going to continue with the theme of ferrite growth, but in multi-component steels where we have more solutes than just carbon present. Uh, typical steels will contain many different solutes. Uh, I'm going to begin though by introducing the subject of irreversible thermodynamics because it helps us to describe phenomena where there are multiple forces uh, involved. For example, where the diffusion of one solute is influenced by the diffusion of another. Now, equilibrium thermodynamics can be described by this mechanical an analogy, where if I take this ball which lies in this cusp uh, of energy, then give it a, an infinitesimal perturbation, it will tend to come back to its original position. Kinetics, uh, here we have a hill with uh, a varying gradient and there's a ball rolling down the hill. Therefore, energy is being dissipated in that process. And the steady state is when we have a constant gradient to the hill and the ball is rolling and it's dissipating energy but an observer located on the ball will not see a change uh, around that. So, you know, if you have heat diffusing through a chunk of material and the temperatures on either side are maintained constant, then at any point inside the material, you don't see a change happening. And that's steady state. And it, it, this is somewhere between thermodynamics and kinetics. So here, you know, uh, in an allotropic transition, the free energies of two phases would be equal at equilibrium. Uh, in both of these cases, that becomes an inequality because we are dissipating energy and that energy comes from the difference in free energies. Okay, uh, to distinguish between a reversible and an irreversible process, we'll again use a mechanical analogy where we have a cylinder containing an ideal gas uh, and a piston. And this is the pressure versus volume characteristic of that ideal gas. And in this case, I'm assuming that the piston is frictionless. So if we start at some point over here and apply uh, pressure to move the piston to the left, then the volume will contract exactly along this curve. And then when I release the pressure, it will go back exactly along that curve to the original state. So there is no energy actually dissipated in this process. On the other hand, if, if for example, I have friction dissipating energy, uh, so the piston is no longer uh, frictionless, and I start from this point, then I will have to increase the pressure by a certain amount before the piston begins to move and change volume. And after that, it follows this curve, and then when I release the pressure, it won't instantaneously decrease uh, in volume, but it will go down this path and end up here again. So the energy dissipated is the area within this curve. So an irreversible process is defined by the fact that energy is dissipated in that process. There is a very simple equation uh, that governs uh, irreversible thermodynamics. If, if for an isothermal process, I take the temperature and multiply it by the entropy production rate, then that is effectively the energy dissipation rate. Okay? So temperature times the rate of entropy production, and that will equal the product of a flux and a force. And I'm talking about generalized flux and generalized force. So it could be anything if we diffusion of heat. Uh, so in which case this would be the heat flux and this would be whatever drives the flow of heat. Uh, if it is the diffusion of matter, then this would be a diffusion flux. And that would be some sort of a gradient which drives that diffusion. So when you have a process which creates a flux and is being driven by a force, then the product of that flux and force gives us the energy dissipation rate or temperature times the rate of entropy production. And if we can write an equation like this, then we find that 
the flux will be proportional to the force x. So I'll, I'll give you examples of this. The first example uh, involves Ohm's law, which is driving an electrical current across uh, a resistor. So in this electrical circuit, the force which is driving the electrical current is the voltage and energy is being dissipated as the electrical current passes through this resistor and the dissipation rate is obviously the electrical current times the voltage and from the earlier equation we can assume that the electrical current is proportional to the voltage and indeed that is what gives us uh, Ohm's law where the electrical current is equal to the voltage divided by one upon r which is the proportionality constant. Now if we look at heat flux uh, and let's let's think about a reservoir of heat here which has a, a temperature Th and another one which has a temperature Tl which is lower uh, in a closed system and the cross-sectional area is A. Now, supposing we take a small quantity of heat dH and transfer it from dH to dL, then the small change in entropy is given by this transfer of heat divided by the temperature and the same, same here. So the change in entropy is given by this equation. And uh, this is the rate of entropy production, which will be dS by dT per unit volume. Uh, and ds is simply dh into this and therefore we end up with 1 upon v dh by dt into this difference. Now dh by dt is j is the product of the flux of heat times the area. So if I replace dh by dt with j into a then I can write the rate of entropy production is J A over V, which is the distance through which we transfer the heat. And uh, this uh, difference in um, one upon the temperature. So for a small enough uh, change, we have this being equivalent to J into minus one upon T squared into the gradient of temperature. So the product of S dot and T will be j into minus 1 upon t into dt by dz. The minus sign is simply because you know heat is flowing from a higher temperature to a lower temperature, but uh, the gradient is negative. So this is our flux, and this is our force which is driving the flux of heat. And therefore, we expect the flux of heat to be proportional to this quantity, and not simply to the gradient of temperature as would be indicated by Fourier's law which was back in 1822 where the heat flux is defined as a constant times the gradient uh, magnitude of the gradient of the temperature. We should expect k to be a function of temperature and that is in fact what we find uh, experimentally. Of course there are many mechanisms of heat conduction so the dependence on temperature will vary according to whether we are talking about phonons uh, transmitting heat or whatever. So in Fourier's law, K would need to be a function of temperature so that we satisfy the uh, tenets of uh, irreversible thermodynamics. Similarly, when we look at diffusion, and this is a uh, fixed law uh, where Adolf Fick was actually in the anatomy department in Zurich and he was looking at diffusion in liquids. Uh, and he concluded that, you know, the, the flux of solute should be proportional to the difference in concentration and inversely proportional to the distance of the elements from one another. And from that, uh, he wrote down that the diffusion flux is proportional to the concentration gradient times a diffusion coefficient here, which is the proportionality constant. And the negative sign again comes because uh, 
the flux is increasing in this way, but the concentration is decreasing in that direction. In other words, the concentration gradient is negative. Now, we have a problem with this because if I now multiply J by the concentration gradient, I don't get an energy dissipation rate. And we can demonstrate very easily that this doesn't represent the true picture of diffusion in general. Okay. So if we imagine uh, that we are looking at a piece of ice here, which is pure water, and this is the um, salty water of the ocean. And they have been in contact for a very long time, and yet the salt doesn't diffuse into the ice. Why is that? Okay. That clearly doesn't satisfy Fix's law because we've got a concentration gradient of salt between the salty water and the ice, and yet the ice remains pure. So why is that? In order to understand that, uh, we need to express really the force driving diffusion in terms of a free energy gradient rather than a concentration gradient. So to do that, I will define uh, quickly the physical meaning of a chemical potential. So supposing we have a solid solution between A and B, which uh, has a free energy variation with composition like so, and we look at a particular concentration X here then, and draw a, a tangent at that point, then this is the intercept on the pure A axis and this is the intercept on the pure B axis, where X is the concentration of B. And the free energy of this solution at the concentration X is given by this. Now I can write this free energy as a weighted sum of these two quantities like so. So this is the free energy of a solution of composition X, which is equal to the intercept mu A times the concentration of A plus the intercept mu B times the concentration of X. Uh, these terms are simply the free energies of the pure A and pure B states. So what we've done here is partitioned the energy of the solution of composition X into a component entirely due to A and another component entirely due to B. And we call this the chemical potential of A and the chemical potential of B, effectively a, a free energy of A atoms in a solution of composition X. And obviously mu A and mu B will vary with concentration because the tangents that we draw will be with different slopes. So just think about the chemical potential as the mean free energy of an A atom in a solution of a particular composition. Then it becomes clear why salt doesn't diffuse between the oceanic water and ice. Because if we draw the free energy curves of ice and of seawater at equilibrium, they will share this chemical, uh, this common tangent and the chemical potentials of both species in both phases will be identical. Okay, so they will therefore be at equilibrium. Even though their chemical compositions are different, as you can see on this horizontal axis, there is no tendency for diffusion because the free energy of a water molecule in the sea is the same as the free energy of a water molecule in ice and similarly for sodium chloride. Okay, so if the chemical potentials are uniform everywhere. There is no tendency for diffusion, but if they are non-uniform, then they will tend to homogenize by bringing the potentials in the two, two regions to be identical, both of iron and of manganese in this case. So Fix's law is that J is equal to minus D times the concentration gradient, but we want to write it in terms of a free energy gradient because the product of the flux and the force d mu by dz is a free energy dissipation. Uh, now, m is simply a constant relating j and the gradient here. And because mu is defined per unit concentration, we also multiply by uh, the actual concentration. I can now expand this. Uh, as uh, d mu by dz, as d mu by dc into dc by dz. Uh, 
And you can see that these two terms are identical and therefore we write the diffusion coefficient uh, as a, a constant mobility times the concentration times the way in which the chemical potential varies with concentration. So this gives the diffusion coefficient a concentration dependence. And furthermore, when we substitute this into, um, into the irreversible thermodynamics equation, the diffusion flux times the um, chemical potential gradient gives us the energy dissipation rate. And therefore the flux is proportional to this gradient. Uh, we've already shown that the heat flux is proportional to this. And similarly, the electrical current is proportional to the uh, electromotive force gradient, in other words, the voltage. And similarly, when we do plastic deformation, stress will be proportional to strain rate if we ignore things like, um, um, or rather the strain rate will be proportional to the stress if we ignore things like work hardening and so forth. So all of these processes are driven by free energy gradients and the product of these two quantities gives us an energy dissipation rate. Now, I sort of said without much justification at all that if we can write temperature times entropy production rate as equal to a flux times a force, then the flux will tend to be proportional to the force. And I'm going to give you a, a, an empirical um, proof for this. So if I write my flux as a function of a force, and I use curly brackets like this, uh, or braces, whenever I want to imply a functional relationship. So this is not J multiplied by X, but J as a function of X. Then I can do a polynomial expansion uh, of this. So this is uh, J at zero, and the derivative of J at zero, and, and so on. And if we simplify this, by first of all, ignoring the high order terms. And secondly, you know, obviously there can't be a flux when the force is zero. Then we recover that J will be proportional to X. So this also, uh, this is a, a good way of explaining things because it also says that, look, um, if I have a very large force, it may not be the case that I can ignore higher order terms, okay? Now, at what point we cannot actually ignore higher order terms has to be determined experimentally. So, a real example where that matters. Uh, so imagine that uh, uh, we have interface controlled growth of ferrite because we are transforming from austenite to ferrite either in pure iron or in an iron manganese alloy where the manganese doesn't diffuse at all because the temperatures are not appropriate for diffusion, then the parent and product phases have exactly the same chemical composition. So the only thing that controls the rate of interface motion in practice would be the transfer of atoms across the interface. So here is our interface here between the austenite and the ferrite. These are just equilibrium positions within the lattice of atoms and for we have a free energy difference delta g between the ferrite and gamma so there's a tendency for the interface to move towards the right uh, and g star is the activation barrier across the interface between the austenite and ferrite so there will be a flux of atoms from gamma to alpha and a reverse flux from alpha to gamma because you know diffusion is a stochastic process so the flux J gamma to alpha is easy because it's just exponential minus G star over RT. Uh, J is proportional to that. Uh, there will be an attempt frequency and the chances of making it over the barrier are this. G alpha gamma, the reverse flux, you have to overcome a larger barrier here, which is G star plus the magnitude of the driving force. Uh, and therefore, the velocity of the interface will be proportional to the net transfer of atoms, which is J gamma alpha minus J alpha gamma. And if you take that difference uh, and take this factor out common, 
then the velocity will be proportional to this term related to this activation barrier. And then this term, which is the magnitude of the driving force. Now, clearly, uh, we don't have a linear relationship between velocity and the driving force because the product of velocity and the driving force gives us the energy dissipation rate. So the physically derived equation here, which covers, uh, which doesn't place limits on the magnitude of delta G, does not give us a linear dependence of velocity versus driving force. But if the driving force is small, then this term simplifies to the magnitude of delta G divided by RT, and we recover the velocity as being proportional to delta G, okay? So at a small enough driving force, uh, we will be justified in using uh, the relationship between flux and force. Now, that isn't the whole story. You see, given that we've now accepted that if we can write temperature times entropy production rate as a product of a flux and a force, and that J will then be proportional to X, uh, we can expand this relationship into multiple fluxes and forces. So if we have more than one process happening, for example, the diffusion of solute and the diffusion of heat at the same time, then we can simply write them, uh, sorry, this sigma is, is uh, another term that I've often used for entropy production rate, so it should be S dot here. So temperature times S dot, the rate, uh, this is the energy dissipation rate, will be the sum of all the uh, products of the forces and fluxes. Okay, so if you have multiple forces and fluxes, then uh, the relationship between the flux and the force still applies. So we have uh, a particular flux proportional to its own force, but also proportional to other forces uh, because we may have multiple forces operating. So for, for example, here, J1 is proportional to X1 and uh, a mobility M11 or a constant M11 and also will be influenced by another force with a different constant here. And similarly with uh, J2 being a function of both the forces. And if you think about uh, microscopic reversibility, uh, and don't worry about this, then this M21 will be equal to M12. In other words, if we reverse, for example, the interface motion, we expect the same principles to apply. Uh, except in the case of certain magnetic phenomena where you know parity becomes important okay so don't worry about this um, the exciting thing is that we can now deal with for example uh, diffusion of uh, a solute and a diffusion of heat at the same time and here i'm going to show you some experimental data so this is a solid uh, bar of steel and it has a temperature of profile through its section, which looks like this uh, dashed curve here. And originally the carbon concentration in the material was constant. But as a result of this temperature profile, the carbon has actually diffused, driven by the heat flux. There was no, no difference in the chemical potential of carbon before that. But by imposing this temperature gradient, by passing heat uh, into the system, you've got a migration of carbon. Okay. So this is a real effect. And an everyday real effect that you may have missed is that whenever you use a thermocouple, it's a difference in temperature that drives an electrical current. Okay. And the reverse of that is an electric current can introduce a difference in temperature. And that's uh, that's an effect that you would use to create uh, a small refrigerator with no moving parts. Okay, so that's the story about irreversible thermodynamics. And there are two things that I want you to bear in mind. One is that the diffusion coefficient uh, is not defined by Fix's law, but by taking the flux to be proportional to a free energy gradient. Uh, so there will be a dependence of the diffusion coefficient on the way in which the chemical potential varies with concentration. 
uh, and we will assume that in everything else I say from now on, uh, will uh, take the diffusion coefficient as being concentration dependent in the way that I described earlier. So that brings us uh, to talking about ferrite growth in multi-component systems. So in the binary case, uh, we had uh, an average concentration of uh, carbon C bar, and at a particular temperature, we had a, a tie line defining the compositions at the interface if we assume local equilibrium. And uh, I've already pointed out to you that drawing a tangent like this defines the chemical potentials of the species at a particular concentration. Uh, and uh, the physical meaning was expressed by this equation where we partition the free energy into a contribution due to A atoms and a contribution to, due to B atoms. So when we have two phases in equilibrium, uh, a common tangent defines it, the equilibrium compositions because it makes the chemical potentials of the species to be equal in both phases. Now, we can generalize this concept for a multi-component system uh, that, you know, we must have the chemical potentials of all the species equal in all the phases. Uh, so let's, let's just think about an iron carbon manganese system here, iron carbon and manganese being plotted on this axis. And all this is at a particular temperature. Uh, we now, instead of free energy curves, we have free energy surfaces. Think of them like a half a football. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is for the austenite and this is for the ferrite. And instead of a common tangent, we have a tangent plane that touches both these surfaces at particular points and defines a tie line. In other words, the compositions of the two phases which are in equilibrium because there is a uniform chemical potential throughout. Now, because we are in a ternary system, there are extra degrees of freedom. So for example, I can rock that tangent plane while still maintaining contact with both those free energy surfaces. And that means I can generate an infinite set of tie lines uh, for that temperature. And those tie lines define my alpha and alpha plus gamma phase field at a constant temperature. Okay? So there are many, many tie lines which generate this alpha plus gamma phase field. This is the gamma phase field and the alpha phase field. And if I now look at this, um, in a different way, on the, uh, if I look at the horizontal plane, I'm plotting manganese along here and carbon along here. This, these are the tie lines which define the alpha plus gamma phase field. Now these tie lines are of thermodynamic origin. They're not simply radiating through a corner. Um, they, at, at the termination points of each tie line, the chemical potentials of manganese, carbon and iron are identical in gamma and in alpha. So we can calculate these lines uh, if we have appropriate thermodynamic data, which we have plenty of. Uh, and as a last resort, we can actually do measurements to find the thermodynamic data to place these tie lines in place. So assume that we have all these tie lines, okay? Right. Now, um, when we consider the kinetics of ferrite growth in the binary system, we had this basic equation which says that as the interface advances, the rate at which solute is partitioned because the solubilities uh, in the two phases are not equal, and this is the interface velocity, must be equal to diffusion away from the interface in order to maintain the concentrations at the interface uh, at C gamma alpha and C alpha gamma, which are defined by a tie line. Now we have two species diffusing, not just carbon. So we need two equations like this. One for carbon, so this is the rate at which carbon is partitioned and this is the interface velocity, must be equal to the diffusion coefficient of carbon in austenite times its gradient and the diffusion coefficient of manganese uh, in austenite, uh, sorry, uh, 
this is the diffusion coefficient which influences the diffusion of carbon due to a gradient of manganese. And here we have the rate of partitioning of manganese uh, must be equal to the flux away from the interface and that flux is related to the diffusion coefficient of manganese times the gradient of manganese and how carbon influences the diffusion of manganese times the gradient of carbon, okay? So we have the theory to handle this situation and we can do this for any number of solutes. The equations get longer. Now, I'm not uh, actually going to go into that uh, in a great deal of detail because I want to simplify the problem. So I'm going to ignore these cross diffusion terms even though I've explained to you that we can handle them routinely. Okay, but to simplify and explain certain principles, I'm going to just write the rate of solute partitioning as a function of the gradient of the species concerned and ignoring these cross terms. Okay, so we have two equations here. And there is a problem. And the problem is that carbon is an interstitial species, whereas manganese is a substitution of solute. And typically, the diffusion coefficients of manganese is about eight orders of magnitude smaller than that of carbon. Now, these terms are, of course, different, but they are not eight orders of magnitude different. And we have only one interface moving. That means it's moving with the same velocity. So how does the flux of manganese keep pace with that of carbon when their diffusion rates are so different. Okay? So in general, that is not possible because the difference here is too large. Okay? But uh, supposing that we pick a tie line because now we have a, an extra degree of freedom to define local equilibrium. We don't need to pick the tie line that passes through the average alloy concentration. We can pick any tie line in that two phase field, alpha plus gamma phase field. So we could pick a tie line which greatly reduces the gradient of carbon to compensate for its large diffusion coefficient. Okay. Uh, and in that case, the manganese would be able to keep pace with the carbon, uh, even though their mobilities are so different. Alternatively, we could pick a tie line that makes the gradient of manganese very steep to compensate for its low mobility. So I'll illustrate those cases now. So this is again our iron carbon manganese phase diagram and these are tie lines which, which exist and we can find them in phase diagrams, calculations or measurement. Uh, now supposing we have uh, taken an alloy of that composition and quenched it from the austenite phase field into this two phase field so that it's not far off from the fully austenitic phase field. In other words, we are transforming this at a relatively low supersaturation. And I want to pick a tie line which will minimize the gradient of carbon to compensate for its large diffusion coefficient. So I draw a vertical construction line and that defines this tie line, which controls the interface compo uh, compositions. And you can see here that I'm plotting the concentration of carbon in this direction and distance along here. And this is the interface. So we have greatly reduced the gradient of carbon while maintaining its equilibrium concentration. And the corresponding uh, profile for manganese will look like this with a uh, long range partitioning of manganese. So this uh, is going to be a slow transformation rate and we call it partitioning local equilibrium because there is long range diffusion of manganese and the manganese concentration in the ferrite is quite different from that in the austenite. So by reducing the gradient of uh, carbon, we have compensated for its large diffusion coefficient. Okay, um, the second option is that we make the gradient of manganese very steep. 
So this time we are transforming the alloy uh, by quenching from the austenitic state deep into the alpha plus gamma phase field. Uh, so we are close to the ferrite uh, phase field. And I want the manganese concentration profile to be very steep. So I want to partition as little manganese as possible to maintain a local equilibrium. So I will draw a construction line which allows the manganese concentration in the ferrite to be roughly the same as that in the alloy. And that defines this tie line as giving me the interface compositions. And you can see that I've made the gradient of manganese extremely steep, uh, while the difference in carbon between the austenite and uh, ferrite is, is large, okay? So uh, this compensates for the low mobility of the manganese. And the key thing is that we are maintaining local equilibrium at these two interfaces defined by this tie line. And this is called the negligible partitioning local equilibrium. And because it's at a, at a high driving force, uh, this will be a more rapid transformation. But in both cases, you know, if I calculate the growth rate uh, using this concentration profile of manganese, or this concentration profile of carbon, I should get the same growth rate because we have solved those two equations simultaneously. Now, uh, a good question to ask is how does the steel know whether it should transform by inducing a very steep manganese concentration gradient or a very gentle carbon concentration gradient? In other words, by the NPLE or PLE mode. Well, if I draw the wrong if I instead of drawing this horizontal tie line uh, a horizontal construction line if I construct a vertical line through this like so and pick this as the tie line okay so this is now my tie line defining the interface compositions then that clearly is wrong because both the ferrite and the austenite have a larger manganese concentration than the alloy as a whole. Okay. This, if instead of drawing a vertical construction line, I draw a horizontal construction line and pick this as the tie line governing the interface compositions, that clearly is wrong because both ferrite and austenite have lower carbon concentration than the alloy as a whole. Tie lines. Uh, and I draw a right-handed triangle here. Right-handed triangle at each of these tie lines. Uh, and I divide the two-phase field into two parts. Then in this region, I can only get partitioning local equilibrium and only negligible partitioning local equilibrium in this. It's not possible to have both modes of transformation operating everywhere, okay? So the steel doesn't have to decide. It's a natural outcome of where you supercool your austenite uh, in this two-phase field. Okay, at some point, this diffusion profile will become so narrow that it's physically impossible so, you know, you can't have a gradient in which the spike of concentration is so small that you're comparing with uh, atomic dimensions. When that happens, okay, so you're at a temperature when if you want to transform by local equilibrium, this spike becomes physically unreasonable, then the manganese will simply stop moving and we've lost local equilibrium at the interface. Carbon, of course, can still move because it is a faster diffuser. So we no longer have equilibrium, but subject to the fact that manganese cannot move, the carbon will reach a uniform chemical potential. And we define another phase diagram, which is called a para-equilibrium phase diagram, where the manganese is not moving at all. So the tie lines uh, will be approximately horizontal in this phase diagram. So this is no longer an equilibrium phase diagram, but a para-equilibrium phase diagram. Uh, we no longer have equilibrium because manganese is not partitioning. Now, this para-equilibrium phase boundaries 
lie inside the equilibrium phase field. And why is that? Well, when you have zero manganese concentration, the two cases are exactly identical. Uh, there's no difference between equilibrium and para-equilibrium. So they have to meet there. When there is no carbon, since manganese is not partitioning, the austenite and ferrite must have exactly the same composition. Therefore, they meet at this point. So the para-equilibrium phase boundaries will lie within the equilibrium phase boundaries. Okay, so we've dealt with uh, allotromorphic and idiomorphic ferrite, and I just want to briefly talk about the massive transformation where you see enormous grains of ferrite developing, much larger than the austenite grains themselves. So massive ferrite occurs in iron alloys which do not contain carbon and where the ferrite growth rate is large. Okay? Um, that means you've supercooled your material sufficiently. It is a reconstructed transformation, does not lead to a shape deformation other than volume change. And uh, there is no composition change. So this massive ferrite occurs always below the T0 temperature. Now, because the rate of transformation is so large, once a ferrite grain is nucleated, it will grow rapidly. And you know, reconstructive transformations are not limited by grain boundaries of the parent phase. So it rapidly grows and consumes several austenite grains. So you end up with massive ferrite grains. Now I'm going to show you a, a microscope image of massive ferrite and vestiges of the original austenite grain boundaries. And I'll show you how that experiment is done. Well, first of all, we need to be able to observe the austenite grain boundaries even after the transformation is finished. So what we do is we hold it at the austenitizing temperature for long enough for these thermal grooves to develop. You can see these uh, deep, uh, deep grooves which are formed uh, and that they <coughs> arise simply from the balancing of interfacial tensions at the surface. So when we cool this material to form massive ferrite and we only polish very gently, then these grooves will remain there to identify the original austenite grains. Now these uh, dark lines that you see here are the boundaries of the massive ferrite and you can see the remnants of the austenite grain boundary grooves within those ferrite grains. In other words, this chunk of ferrite has really grown across several austenite grains and that's why this is called massive ferrite. But in principle, its mechanism of transmission is the same as that of allotromorphic ferrite or idiomorphic ferrite. Uh, but it involves very large ferrite growth rate, limited only by interfacial processes. Okay, that's all there is for today's lecture. You know, Simon, I have heard of the term mechanical stabilization but never really understood it. Mechanical stabilization is to do with austenite which is severely deformed before it transforms by a displacive mechanism. I see. How does the prior plastic deformation influence transformation? A large density of dislocations due to deformation can block the progress of a glissile transformation interface. It can even bring the transformation to a grinding halt. But Simon. I don't understand why prior deformation accelerates a diffusional transformation but retards one which is displacive. A diffusional transformation destroys the dislocations that existed in the austenite, rather like a recrystallization phenomenon. There is a resulting gain in free energy. I get it. Since there is no diffusion in a displacive transformation, the defects in the austenite are absorbed by the product so there is no gain in free energy in this case. That is indeed true, Brian. Only displacive transformations can be retarded when transformation occurs from deformed austenite. Wow, Simon. What an elegant way to distinguish between reconstructive and displacive transformations. This is a nice restaurant. But I wish I had chosen the vegetarian option. <laughs>